Okay, uh, we've been talking uh, chapter three and bonding. <clears throat> and last time we got into uh, covalent bonding. And we sort of finished up talking about our uh, drawing Lewis structures for covalent bonding. So remember that when you draw a Lewis structure, really you want to think about uh, the sort of logical arrangement of the atoms. Remember that uh, pretty much the least uh, electronegative uh, atom should be in the middle. Uh, we should never have hydrogen or fluorine. Should not be in the middle there. Most importantly, we want the total number of valence electrons. So as we talked about, pretty much uh, uh, that number is really important because you need to have exactly that, that number uh, when you draw your picture, no more, no less. We also talk about the idea of sort of uh, that, the that the electron doesn't necessarily belong to any particular element in it. Uh, we do want to kind of distribute those electrons, electrons sort of equally in our, our picture, picture uh, to, to get, get the correct, correct structure. structure. Uh, uh, we, we don't, don't want to get kind of go, go piecework work, uh, uh, each one trying to figure out how they get to aid and, and stuff, stuff like that. that. Uh, uh, once we have that, that you basically want to make sure uh, we do a single covalent bond from the center to the outside atoms. Any leftover electrons, remember, uh, go on as pairs of electrons on the outside atoms first until they sort of complete their octet. Uh, and then if you still have leftover atom or electrons, they do go to the central atom also in pairs. Uh, at that point, we want to make sure uh, the octet rule is met. Obviously, except for hydrogen, though, it needs two. It's at that point, if it is not met, uh, that is where we want to sort of start with a double bond and see if that will fix it, exhaust sort of all of our double bond options. And then uh, if the double bonds don't take care of the situation, the triple bond uh, should take care of the situation. So uh, the other important thing to talk about is you don't really want a double bond or a triple bond usually right out of the box. Again, you want to sort of use that to fix the situation. That usually will give you a pretty good Lewis structure. Uh, so let's just draw a couple more here before we move on. I want you to do uh, SO2. I uh, want you to do NH4 plus. Uh, I think we did NO3 minus. Uh, let's do uh, N2 and we'll do CO2. All right, so draw the Lewis structures for each of these guys and see what you come up with here. Okay, so let's take a look at what you're doing. Uh, we'll start with the first one here. So, uh, really, one of the first things you want to do, as we talked about, is figure out the total number of electrons. So, uh, you know how many. Electrons your picture should have. Uh, uh, valence electrons, electrons does equal the group number. number. So sulfur is group uh, six there. Uh, there are two oxygens, also group six. Uh, looks like a 12, 18 valence electrons. In this case, uh, we look at uh, oxygen and sulfur on the periodic table. Looks something like that. We see that oxygen is further up, which means it should be more electronegative. And also there's only one sulfur, so it should go in the middle. We again yeah. want to do a single bond uh, from the central atom to each of the outside atoms. Each line represents two electrons, so that's two, four. Uh, we've got 14 more to go. They're going to go pairs on the outside, so two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. That guy is full at that point. We actually have played 16 electrons. We still have two more to go. Uh, they should go as dots there on the central atom. And by the way, that is how the dots get there. They should get there on the central atom. Yeah. It doesn't matter. As long as they're on the center, uh, guy, it should be okay. Yeah. Other question? Yeah. Yeah, so it's just getting there. But yes, <laughs> so we just placed uh, all of our uh, electrons 18. And obviously at this point, we do want to make sure everybody has met the octet rule. Uh, as you correctly said, oxygen's good on each side there. It has eight, but sulfur is short at this point. Uh, it has only six. So we do want to try to fix this by making a double bond. As we talked about, we want to actually bring electrons in to make that double bond. In this case, you can actually do it on either of the oxygens. So what we want to do is take a pair of electrons in to make that double bond. And at this point here, we will end up with something that looks like this. 
This is also a situation where we could have double bonded uh, there to the left. And it would have looked like this, which would have created us a resonance structure that we talked about as well. And either one of these would have been correct sort of pictures, pictures in this particular case. case. Sulfur, Sulfur in the middle now has eight electrons. We still have only a total of 18 electrons used. So either one of these would have been sufficient. sufficient. Or again, if you were asked to do the octet or draw oh. resonance structure, both should be there. You do want to follow these sort of procedures. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people draw this one, double bonded on both sides, no dots on central atoms. So again, you want to make sure you distribute the electrons properly first and not just double bond uh, to try to fix it because um, you will get the wrong structure. Any questions on that one? <laughs> Take a look at the uh, one next to it there. Uh, we'll go with uh, five for nitrogen. Uh, each hydrogen is one. We do have a plus charge, polyatomic ion, and plus means that it has lost electrons. So again, we do need to subtract one off of our total. Uh, that's going to give us eight valence electrons for this guy. Clearly, we know hydrogen cannot be in the middle, so that's going to leave nitrogen in the middle. And in this particular case, we're going to do a single bond to everybody here. Uh, that's going to be two, four, six, eight. That is everything. We do put a bracket and the positive charge on the outside. Again, uh, hydrogen only needs two to, to be all good. Question is on that one there. All right, looking at N2 here, that is uh, two times five, which is 10 valence electrons. There really is no center atom here since there's only two. Uh, so just go side by side. By the way, you can still do the same process that we've done before. So we'll just connect these two. That is a total of two electrons at this point. There's eight more to go. So we can still do the same things we did previously. So two, four, six, and eight. At this point, we have distributed all 10 of our electrons. We can see the guy on the right there is good. It's got eight electrons. The nitrogen on the left has only four. So that is not good. Once again, we're going to try to fix this by making a double bond. So we're going to take a pair of electrons in to do so. That will give us something that looks like this, which is now got nitrogen on the right has eight. Nitrogen on the left has six. So it got better, but still not good because it doesn't have eight. At this point, there's no really other options to make double bonds. So at this point, we're going to make a triple bond work the same way. We're going to take another pair of electrons and basically bring it in to make the triple bond. And this is how nitrogen gets to a triple bond there between them. And now each nitrogen by sharing through that triple bond, uh, we'll have eight electrons on each side and we will end up with the proper structure. Any questions on that one there? Yeah. I'm not sure I'll let you know. Other questions? <laughs> All right, taking a look at the uh, next one, which is CO2. We got like uh, four for carbon, two times six for the oxygen, uh, 16, it looks like in this case. In this case, uh, if we look at carbon and oxygen, they are in the same period on the periodic table. Oxygen is further to the right, which means it's more electronegative. That should put carbon in the middle. We're going to do the same deal. Yep. We're going to do a single bond here. That is two, four electrons. Uh, that means we got uh, 12 more to go. So two, four, six, eight, 10, and 12. That fills up the oxygen here on each side. Uh, uh, they do have eight. eight. Again, Again, here, carbon, carbon in the middle is going to be a little short. short. It has only four electrons. So we're going to try to fix it by making a double bond. So we're going to bring uh, electrons in to do so. And that will give us a double bond here on the left. And now uh, carbon has gotten better. It's got six, but it is still short. Now here's a situation where we actually do have the ability to double bond to the right as well. Uh, I would recommend exhausting all your double bond options before you triple bond. Uh, and we'll talk about why that is maybe in just a sec. Uh, uh, so, so in this case, case uh, we, we actually, actually still have the ability to double bond on this side. So that's probably what we want to do. And we're going to double bond it up there. 
And now we have 16 total electrons. Carbon has eight. Both of the oxygens have eight as well. Any questions on that one? <laughs> so again, if you follow these sort of rules that we talked about on how to draw these things, it really should end up in a pretty good picture uh, when it's all said and done. Maybe not the best, best picture, picture all the all time, time for certain situations, situations, but, but pretty, pretty much, much most of the time, time should be a pretty, pretty good, good picture. picture. Again, again, try, try to avoid double bonding, bonding triple bonding, bonding out of the box, box and stuff, stuff like that. that. Any questions on that there? I draw those structures. structures. Okay. okay. Then, then uh, uh, let, let us continue, continue on, on, I think. So let's talk about formal charge and Lewis structures. So formal charge is uh, the difference between the number of valence electrons in an isolated atom and the number of electrons assigned to it in its Lewis structure. To calculate the formal charge, you basically take uh, the number of valence electrons in the free element minus the number of uh, non-bonding electrons. So these are basically your dots in your picture minus one half the number of bonding electrons, which are basically your lines in your, in your Lewis structure. So uh, formal charge is used for a couple of situations. It, it allows us to understand the charges that are uh, sort of on each of the atoms within the bonding of that molecule. It also, as we will talk about shortly, can be used to help us decide maybe between two Lewis structures, uh, which one's a good one, maybe the better Lewis structure than another. Uh, so we can use formal charge to help us decide between two equivalent type of structures, uh, which one might be better structure than another. So let's take a look at formal charge here. And if we drew something like ozone, which looks like this, and we wanted to calculate the formal charge on each of these elements, uh, basically, uh, we will take each one individually. So we do have a double bonded oxygen. And if we take the double bonded oxygen, uh, the formal charge would be six for oxygen, which is a normal valence electron, minus the number of non-bonding electrons. And these are just individual sort of dots, if you will. So that's four. Minus one half the number of bonding electrons. So in this particular case, we have one line which represents two electrons. We have two, another line represents two electrons. So that is four in this case. So that is six minus four, which is two, minus a half of four, uh, which is zero. So the formal charge here on the oxygen that is double bonded is basically zero. Now, if we do the oxygen in the middle, it kind of has a double bond, some dots, and a single bond on the other side. And if we look at the oxygen in the middle, uh, its formal charge would once again be six because that's oxygen valence electrons minus the number of non-bonding electrons, which in this case is two only, minus one half the number of bonding electrons. So that's two, four, and six. And in this case, that is six minus two, which is four, and four minus three is plus one. So this oxygen here, in the middle is carrying a plus one formal charge that's happening in that arrangement of sharing electrons like so. And lastly, we have a single bonded oxygen there at the end. And if we did the formal charge for this guy, six minus uh, two, four, six electrons, minus one half of two bonding electrons, uh, and that's going to be six minus six is zero minus a half of two, which is one. So that's going to be a negative one uh, overall formal charge for that particular guy. If we add up all the formal charges there. It does equal the overall charge here, this guy, which is neutral. But in terms of how the electrons are being shared between the oxygens here, uh, we can see that uh, in the case of the middle guy, he's taking on a more plus one sort of situation. And the guy on the right there is taking a more minus one situation. Any questions on how to calculate the formal charge here? All right, so why don't you try one here and see, why don't you do uh, carbonate? So for each of the elements there, the carbon, the three oxygen, take a look. Uh, we'll start with, uh, we'll start with our double bonded oxygen here. 
So the formal charge here uh, would be six for oxygen minus, again, non-bonding electrons. That's four minus one half the bonding, which is two and four. And that's going to give us, again, here, six minus four is two minus two, basically, which is zero. So this guy here has a formal charge of zero. We'll do our single bonded oxygen on the left or the right. They are going to come out the same, by the way. Uh, that's going to give us six minus our non bonding two, four, six minus one half of our bonding, uh, which is two. And it's going to be six minus six, uh, which is zero minus one, basically, which gives us negative one. So negative one here and negative one there. So they're both going to be the same. Now, if we look at our carbon, uh, look something like this. Uh, formal charge here going to be four in this case for carbon minus uh, zero as there's no dots on carbon. So no non-bonding electron minus one half of each of these lines represent two, four, six and eight. And that's going to give us a formal charge of zero, four minus four, basically. Uh, sometimes people will not count individual electrons for the bonding. They'll just count bonds. It comes out the same. Whichever way you want to do it, it has four bonds, which is half of eight, which is four. Now, in this case, that's the formal charge here. And we can see, by the way, that is basically where the negative two charge comes from something in carbonate. Uh, each of these single bonded oxygens are basically carrying a minus one sort of charge in this arrangement. And that, again, is sort of why carbonate there has an overall minus two charge as the distribution of how the electrons are being shared uh, gives those oxygens a more negative sort of overall charge. Any questions on that there? <laughs> so obviously you can calculate formal charge uh, just to calculate formal charge on each of the elements. We could also use formal charge to help us, as I mentioned before, you know, maybe you are drawing some Lewis structures and you're like, well, I could do this, or I could do this, or maybe I could put like this guy in the middle and not this one in the middle or to have some different sort of connectivity. So we could use formal charge to help us decide between different sort of Lewis structures, uh, which one would be perhaps maybe a better picture or a better Lewis structure than another. Now for neutral molecules, a Lewis structure with no formal charge is preferred. So pretty much in most situations, if you could get the formal charge of everybody down to zero or pretty close to zero, so that's kind of like the best situation and probably the best structure that you could draw. Uh, Lewis structures with really large formal charges like plus twos, plus threes are less likely or plausible to happen. Uh, when you're choosing, again, between different uh, Lewis structures, uh, you're looking for the one where also the more negative formal charge ends up on the more electronegative atom. And again, that makes sense because electronegative atom would draw electrons towards itself, probably making it more negative, right, than positive. And that's going to be probably a much better sort of arrangement that's happening. So again, we can use these as guidelines and formal charge to help us decide between two. So for example, if you had, uh, say, something like CH2O and you had to draw Lewis structures. There's a couple of different ways you could arrange it, and maybe you end up with these two sort of Lewis structures where maybe you distribute the hydrogens uh, a little bit differently than you would in the case on the right there. So calculate the formal charge on each of these guys and use it to decide which one is the better structure. And while you're at it, why don't we also look at uh, this guy? which is our CO2 we drew earlier. And let's just say that you decided you didn't want to double bond both sides, but you wanted to instead triple bond. All right, so between these, which one would be the better structure based on formal charge? So go ahead and take some time to decide. Okay, so let's take a look and see. Uh, so we'll start here on the bottom. Uh, we're going to start with formal charge here for our single bonded hydrogen. Uh, that's going to be one for hydrogen minus zero. So there's no dots. 
minus one half of two, uh, which gives us a formal charge of zero on hydrogen. Uh, the hydrogen on the right hand side would be the same as it would come out the same. Uh, if we look at the carbon here, it looks something like this. We just look at the bonds that are happening. So carbon is four minus two, which is our non bonding electrons, minus one half of, we basically got three lines, which gives us six electrons. So that's going to give us four minus two, which is two, uh, minus three, minus one, I believe, there for our carbon. And if we look at our oxygen, which uh, looks something like this, I think, uh, the formal charge for it would be six minus two, minus one half of six. So that's going to be us uh, four minus three, going to be plus one. So this is sort of the distribution of charge within this first form uh, structure. We do the same thing over here for our second possible structure. Our hydrogen is going to come out the same. If they will always come out the same, by the way. One minus uh, zero minus one half of two, which gives us zero. So zero for this guy, zero for this guy. We do our uh, double bonded oxygen. It's going to be... Uh, Six for the oxygen minus four, minus one half of four, again, two for each of the lines there. And that's gonna be zero. And lastly, our carbon in this case basically has this situation. And that's gonna give us a formal charge of four minus zero minus one half of eight, uh, which would be zero as well. So between these two structures, one on the left, one on the right, which one is the better one based on formal charge? It should be the one on the right. Yeah, it has really sort of minimized all the formal charge, right? Gives it really a more equal sharing of electrons throughout the whole guy uh, molecule here. And that would be the much better structure there. Questions on that one. Then. Now, here we drew this earlier, our uh, CO2, and this is the one we drew earlier, but again, what happens, like I said, that you chose, well, I don't want to double bond, maybe both sides, maybe I could just go right into a triple bond. Would that give me maybe a better structure? So we'll take a look at the one up here on top. We have our single bonded oxygen, which looks like this. Formal charge would be six minus six minus one half of two. Again, six non-bonding electrons there and two from there. Uh, that's going to give us a negative one. Now we have the carbon in the middle, which has a triple bond on one side and a single bond on another. And that's going to give us a formal charge of four minus zero. So there's no dots minus one half of eight as there's four lines. And that's going to give us a formal charge here of zero. Lastly, here in our triple bonded, uh, we have our triple bonded oxygen with some dots. That's going to give us a formal charge of six minus two minus one half of six. That's four minus three, basically, plus one. So we have a plus one distribution here. So we have a minus one, a zero, and a plus one. Uh, we look down here to our CO2 like we drew it before. We have our double bonded oxygen. Uh, which means we have six minus four minus one half of four, which is going to be zero. That means this guy will also be zero. And we have our carbon here, uh, which is four minus zero minus one half of eight for the four bonds gives us zero as well. So is it better to double bond in the case of CO2 or triple bond? Based on formal charge, you get a much better structure by double bonding both for the oxygens rather than triple bonding. So these are some of the reasons why we do some of those things like double bond first and before we go to triple bond in certain situations, you know, based on formal charge, it gives us a better distribution and a better sort of structure. Any questions on that there? Obviously, also the guy, uh, the first one that we did, when we look at the sort of distribution also of formal charges in this particular one, uh, we actually have the more positive formal charge on the more electronegative atom, right? If you look between carbon and oxygen on the periodic table, oxygen is more electronegative, but here it would be carrying a more positive formal charge 
and say a negative form of charge, also not a great situation uh, for that particular structure. Any questions on how to calculate formal charge, use it to determine between different Lewis structures, which one might be a better choice. So the idea there is when you're using formal charge to decide, and then to minimize formal charge to the best uh, on all elements is sort of the best sort of arrangement. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> all right. So we talked a little bit about resin structure, and we're going to talk about it again, but also let's talk a little bit about bond length. And this is a table of bond lengths, and you don't need to memorize the numbers, obviously, or anything here. But if we look at the bond length, and that is the distance between the nucleuses of each of the atoms, we look at the carbon-carbon single bond is 154, double bond 133, and triple bond 120. And if we look at the carbon-nitrogen single bond 143, double bond 138, and triple bond 116, what we see is actually as we have a single bond, the atoms are able to really kind of spread out a little further. As we bring those electrons in, for example, to do a double bond, the distance gets smaller. And as we bring more electrons in, it's the middle going to drag everybody closer to each other. Uh, we end up with a smaller distance between them. So single bond is the longest, followed by double bond and triple bond. Again, if you think about it, as you bring those electrons in between the two atoms, you're building up the negative charge between the two atoms in the middle, and that's going to attract the nucleuses of each of them in to those negative charges, and it's going to make the distance between them become much smaller. So it gets smaller every time you add a, basically a bond in there. Everybody kind of comes in closer and closer because of that negative sort of distribution in the middle. How that relates to strength is a triple bond is actually stronger than a double bond and a double bond is stronger than a single bond. They're not like twice as strong a double bond or three times as strong a triple bond. But that's a general trend that goes with our bond length. I think of it like a brand new pencil, right? If you take like a brand new pencil out of the box, it's nice and long, you can snap that thing with no problem, right? Kind of break it in half. You take a pencil after you took a chemistry test, maybe you just got like an eraser and a nub in there left of your pencil. And it's really, really small. If you try to break that, it's very, very difficult, right? To try to break that really, really small little bit of pencil that's left. Again, everything is basically pushed together, right? So it's going to be much stronger to do so. And that's sort of how bond strength sort of works. Um, we talked about electronegativity about that we talked about bond polarity earlier on i think uh we talked a little bit about uh, bond dipole moments earlier on again remember that when we talk about bond polarity um we are talking about uh a difference in electronegativity and uh, using that to decide how the electrons are being shared in a bond between two atoms if something has a dipole moment, as we talked about, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about it in the next chapter, again, it means overall the molecule is polar, and that is uh, what we're usually talking about here. So we'll get into that. We actually did earlier. So we'll talk about a little bit bond energy, and uh, bond energy we're going to talk about here when we're breaking and making bonds, and that's definitely not your table. I'll just carry it out there. So uh, a little bit about bond energy, as I talked about maybe just in general about energy is uh, there is a certain amount of energy required to make bonds and break bonds. And a reminder that when we make bonds, that is a uh, exothermic process, which means energy needs to be released and usually a negative sort of value for that. Again, if you think about when you want to make bonds, you got things with a lot of energy. They actually need to release energy to kind of slow down and allow them to sort of come together and make that bond. Now, when we break bonds, that is an endothermic process uh, where heat and energy is absorbed, and those typically are positive values. And again, the idea there is if we have a bond, we need to put energy in there for everybody to gain energy and they'll have enough energy to sort of wiggle away from each other and break bonds. Why this is important when we look at a chemical reaction, which is reactants on the left-hand side of the arrow 
going to products on the right hand side of the arrow. When we are dealing with a chemical reaction, the only thing we're doing is basically breaking all the bonds on the left hand side. So all these guys get broken or break them. And we basically make all these bonds on the right hand side in a chemical reaction as a chemical reaction only involves making and breaking bonds, which is our electrons. So we can actually basically figure out the change in enthalpy. For a reaction based on bond energy. And when we do delta H, which is typically the way we look at sort of a reaction and determine whether or not overall the reaction is exothermic or endothermic, if you get a change in enthalpy and you get a negative number, that means overall the reaction was an exothermic reaction. If you calculate the delta H and it is a positive number, uh, then it's going to be an endothermic process where energy is basically absorbed. So how do we calculate the uh, change in enthalpy using bond energy, or sometimes referred to as bond enthalpy? Uh, basically, all you have to do is uh, the change in enthalpy for the reaction is basically all the delta H's of your bonds that you broke, plus all the delta H's of the bonds that you made. So basically add up all the individual bonds that you break on the reactant side, and then you add up all the individual bonds that you're going to make on the product side. And you basically add them together, and if you end up with the delta H is positive, it'll be endothermic. If you end up with the delta H is negative, it'll be an endothermic process overall based on bond energy or bond enthalpy. Questions on that there. And there obviously is a table uh, that you can look up uh, that will give you the energy to break a single bond or a double bond or a triple bond between two elements. So let's take a look at how to do one of these. Uh, so here's an actual table. And let's just say uh, we wanted to uh, look at this reaction here. Of I'll do this one. It's kind of messy here. We have CH4 and CH4 plus Cl2. And we have CH3. All right. So the first thing that you would want to do, perhaps, and this is a table, obviously, where you could look up all the values, is much like we see sort of on the previous page there, if you're not sure what each of these look like in terms of their Lewis structures, probably the best thing to do is to draw a quick Lewis structure of each of these. It's also sometimes when you're doing these type of problems, a really good idea to actually draw the Lewis structure so you can visually see all the bonds. It's very common people will sort of miss bonds when they just kind of look at the formulas and how things are connected. Uh, so, for example, obviously here, in terms of what we're going to do is all these guys over here, uh, we're going to break. And all these bonds over here, uh, we're going to make, basically. So if we draw in terms of uh, what we got going on there, um, and I'll draw a little bit better here. We have our CH4 plus our Cl2 here. And these are all the ones that we're going to break. So when we look at it here, uh, we have basically four carbon hydrogen single bonds that we need to break. We also have one chlorine chlorine single bond that we also need to break so we basically need to uh, break all of these bonds here and here so we will go to our table here and basically find the values for each of these so a carbon hydrogen bond is right here that is 414 and our cl cl bond is down here 243 so we have uh 414, 243. And we do need to multiply it by how many we're doing. So we're going to times that by four. And we're going to times that by uh, one. I feel like I threw an extra number in there. It's 243. 
All right, so we got our 243 times 1 and our 4 times our 414. That's going to give us, in terms of sort of breaking, a value of 414 times 4 plus uh, 243, 1899 kilojoules, right? Now, remember, breaking is an endothermic process, which means that these numbers are all going to be positive, basically 1,899 kilojoules of energy we need to put in there. When we get to our product side, I'll draw these a little bit better here. We end up with this guy that looks like this, and we end up with uh, this right here. Now, in terms of what we need to make now on our product side, we need to make uh, three carbon-hydrogen bonds, uh, one, two, and three. We also need to make a new bond, which is a carbon-chlorine bond that wasn't there before. And lastly, we also need to make a hydrogen-chlorine bond. So uh, we know previously that that is 414 times three for our carbon-hydrogen single bond. We go to our table and do uh, carbon chlorine. There, there it is on the bottom. 339 for that guy. So we got 339 times one. And lastly, hydrogen chlorine, uh, which is right here at 431 there. And these, again, are all the bonds we need to make basically. So we're going to take uh, 414 times 3 plus 339 and 431. That's going to give us a 2012 kilojoules of energy. Now making bonds again is an exothermic process which means all this energy is going to be released which means technically speaking all these values are negative. And this guy should end up as being negative. So our delta H for this reaction uh, would be our positive 1899 kilojoules plus our negative 2012 kilojoules. And what we will see here then is 1899 uh, minus basically 2012. going to give us a negative 113 kilojoules. That means overall this reaction based on bond energy is a endothermic reaction or exothermic reaction? It is an exothermic reaction as we ended up with a negative value for delta H. Any questions on that? So this is really probably the simplest way to sort of figure out bond energy or change in enthalpy based on bond energy. Just add up all the bonds that you broke and add up all the bonds that you made. I will say sometimes books will do in this case, for example, if we look on the left there, uh, we basically broke uh, four carbon-hydrogen bonds, but we made three carbon-hydrogen bonds. So that's really just a net breaking of one. So sometimes they'll kind of take it out. So uh, you'll sometimes see people do that calculation like that. So won't have anything on the right-hand side. So just break one of the bonds. So you can do that as well. Any questions on that there? Obviously, the table would be provided for you, maybe. So why don't we try, uh, why don't you do this one? Let's do uh, N2 uh, plus uh, H2 makes NH3. I'll do a little balancing there, 2, 6, 3. All right, what is the delta H of this reaction based on bond energy? So take a few moments, calculate it up. recommend uh, drawing the Lewis structures, uh, even if you don't kind of complete them, but just so you can kind of see what bonds are are there. Again, if you didn't draw Lewis structure, uh, you, again, may not realize we are looking at a triple bond happening there with our nitrogen. Uh, and for our hydrogen, it is a single bond, but we also have some coefficients, right? So that means I don't have just one of those hydrogens, don't have two but I actually have three of them. So you got to take all that into account here in terms of all the bonds that you need to break. And obviously we're going to break all these bonds over here. 
Same thing on our product side. You might want to jot your Lewis structure down really quick. And if you did, uh, you would look something like this. And once again, the coefficient here is important since we don't have one of those, but we actually have two of those. You got this happening here. So and that's uh, obviously what we're going to make. So now we have sort of a visual representation of what we need to break and make. Uh, again, it sometimes makes it easier so you don't miss any bonds. In this case, we actually have one of our nitrogen-nitrogen triple bonds, uh, which is 946 right here. So we have uh, 1 times 946 for our triple bond. In this case, since we do have three hydrogen-hydrogen single bonds, is going to be 3 times our uh, 4 or 36. Bless you. And that's everything that we need to break. So that's going to get us a uh, 946 plus uh, 3 times 436. It's going to give us a positive 2254. Again, it's positive because it's breaking. So it's endothermic energy has to come in to do so. Now, looking over here on our making side, uh, we basically have one, two, three, four, five, and six uh, nitrogen hydrogen bonds that we're making. Uh, so we got six times our nitrogen hydrogen, which is right there, looks like 389. 389 kilojoules. And that's going to get us there uh, three times, I'm oh, sorry, not three, six times. 389. It's going to be uh, 2234 kilojoules. Remember that this is making, so that's exothermic, so it has to be a negative. Now we got everything that we are making and breaking, so our delta H for this reaction would be our make our breaking, positive 2254, plus our breaking, minus 2234 kilojoules in this case. So uh, 2254, uh, basically minus 2334, are going to give you a minus 80 kilojoules overall. And this reaction would be exothermic based on bond energy. Any questions on that there? <laughs> so again... I would draw the Lewis structures. That way you can see all the bonds and hopefully not miss anything. Uh, I would say uh, very commonly is sort of when there are two central atoms, people sort of miss the guy, that connection in the middle. So, for example, if we look at, uh, I think we have one coming here, like here. Uh, here we do have, obviously, our breaking that's happening here. And we have our one times our hydrogen, hydrogen, which as we just saw there was 436. We have a oxygen double bond, uh, which is 498. And that's gonna give us everything that we're going to break. So basically 436 plus a 498 can give us a positive 934 kilojoules on the breaking. Making here, this is hydrogen peroxide. Uh, we have a oxygen-hydrogen single bond on each side. So we have two of those oxygen-hydrogen single bonds, uh, which is uh, right there at 464, it looks like. And this is sometimes where people will miss a bond, kind of like we have these two central atoms, this oxygen-oxygen single bond. So again, just drawing it out, you can visually sort of see that you do have that bond. And again, uh, that's a very common thing that sometimes people will miss is that, and that's like a 142 there. And that would get us uh, 2 times 464 plus a 142. And again, this is going to be negative as it is making. So in this case, our delta H would be 934 plus negative 1070 kilojoules. And we end up with a negative 136 kilojoules in this case, also exothermic. So 
again, that sort of center bond is oftentimes missed when people are doing this, especially when they just kind of go from the chemical formulas in the equation. Any question on bond energy or how to calculate it, what it means? And again, if we look at it, as we saw earlier, double bond is stronger, more energy uh, required to break it. As we can see here, obviously, um, we talked about our triple bond versus double versus single. We can see that the triple bond takes a lot more energy to break and make, and a single bond is a lot less energy. So again, that correlates to what we talked about earlier. Any questions on that there? All right. So we talked about resonance structures, kind of like when we're doing uh, Lewis structures. Again, a resonance structure really does sort of arise uh, when we do have perhaps more options of where you can put that double bond. You could draw an equivalent structure by really just kind of moving the double bond around. And again, that's because those electrons are really sort of delocalized or moving around uh, from one spot to the next. Again, in between resonance structures, we usually draw these arrow heading in both directions to indicate that they are resonance structures. So uh, ozone, uh, that we did the formal charge, which is what the pluses and negatives are here, also can draw a resonance structure. Again, that double bonded electrons kind of moving around from one oxygen to the next. And you could draw an equivalent sort of structure for each of those. Uh, we did carbonates as well, I think, when we were drawing. So, again, these are three uh, equivalent sort of carbonate structures. Again, they have the formal charges actually drawn into this picture. That's why they don't have the brackets or the minus two on the outside, uh, because it's actually shown it in the picture. Um, benzene ring, uh, take organic, is a, a six carbon ring that looks like this. Each of these parts here are carbons at each of these points. These are all carbons. And it also has three double bonds in it and you could draw a resin structure where those double bonds have moved around the ring. Sometimes you'll even see benzene drawn in some books with a, like a little circle in the middle. And that indicates that, again, that those double bond electrons are moving around the ring and can be located in any of those sort of positionings. Uh, so as we talked about, you do not need to draw all the resonance structures every time unless you are asked to draw them. Obviously, then you should. Uh, but if you're just asked, again, to draw carbonate, any one of the three structures obviously would be appropriate. Uh, but again, if you're asked to draw all the resonance structures, you should include them all. All right, so this is a lot of double bonds moving. There's a bunch of options for this guy. Not all that important, I think. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some exceptions to the octet rule. And for the most part, uh, most of the things that you draw will obey the octet rule. Uh, but there are some exceptions where definitely in this class we will sort of not obey the octet rule. Uh, so there are three different types of exceptions to the octet rule. The first one is an incomplete octet. And much like the uh, name sounds like, it means that somebody is just fine with less than eight electrons. So normally we want to get to eight, but there are certain ones that are pretty much okay with it. Uh, beryllium, aluminum, and boron are probably your top three. In the case, though, of most situations, boron is probably going to be the one most of the time that you're going to see. Uh, here's beryllium. Obviously, it has only two, four electrons. Boron here, in this case, two, four, six electrons, and it's perfectly happy that way. Uh, it's an incomplete octet. It is what is sometimes referred to as being electron deficient uh, because it is an incomplete octet. It actually gives it some good properties. It is actually something that is a good Lewis acid, for example. Uh, and Lewis acids are things that it will accept electrons. So because it's deficient in electrons, it's able to sort of accept electrons. So it works really well. Beryllium aluminum, we don't see too much in uh, covalent bonding. Uh, but it is kind of used as examples as well. So probably in terms of incomplete octet, uh, boron and six electrons is going to be the one that you might come across the most. Another exception to the octet rule is an odd number of electrons. 
Uh, so some molecules, when you add up the total number of valence electrons, you get an odd number. And if you get an odd number, that means that somebody will have an unpaired electron. So you'll have an unpaired electron like we see here in NO and NO2 as well. Uh, we have an unpaired electron happening there. Uh, sometimes unpaired electrons are referred to as free radicals. Chlorine does that a lot in the atmosphere. And they're very reactive because of that, because they have an unpaired electron. So they kind of want to fix that situation a lot of times. So these things are a lot of times very, very reactive. Um, now, probably the most common exception to the octet rule that you see the most, and definitely in this class that you see the most, is this guy right here. And that is the expanded octet. And the expanded octet is one where you actually can go above eight. And you could go somewhere upwards of 12 electrons instead of eight. So you could do 10 and 12 electrons. And the elements that are able to do that, frankly, are if you look at the periodic table where you find your friend sulfur and you go a little bit to the right there, a little bit to the left above the staircase and down. Uh, these are the elements that have the ability basically to do the expanded octet. And there is a really good reason for that. And the reason is uh, sulfur is on the third period of the periodic table. And the third period of the periodic table is N is equal to three. N is equal to three means uh, what electrons or what orbitals are on the third energy level. There are S's, there are P's, and that is the very first energy level where we see d orbitals yeah so that's the very first energy level where we see d orbitals so because they have d orbitals available to them even if they're not using them uh, they actually have places to house the extra electrons so because of those d orbitals availability things where sulfur is on the periodic table and mainly really your non-metals heading into your noble gases and stuff below is what we're talking about here uh, have the ability to go above eight. That also means that if you look at the guys above that, like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and so forth, that is on the second energy level, our second period. And that is N is equal to two. There is no D orbitals there. That means these guys can never, ever go above eight. So they can never go above eight because they don't have the ability to do that. So you should never go above eight with those guys. But anything with sulfur below has the ability to do that because of uh, those d orbitals being available to them. Uh, so if you draw something like SF6, uh, basically it will look like this. And I won't draw all the dots on the fluorine here. Uh, but just looking at the sulfur... It's got uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 electrons around it and is perfectly okay with that. Now, perhaps you've done this before or haven't done it before, or perhaps you did the really bad thing of, uh, you know, you used Google or something when you were doing Lewis structures previously and you had a picture like sulfate. And if you follow the steps that we talked about and you draw sulfate you will end up with something that looks like this now if you google sulfate for your lewis structures which you shouldn't do because you should draw it yourself right and maybe you ended up with a structure that looks like this and maybe you drew that in your previous class and maybe your teacher put an X on it because you didn't do the expanded octet and you shouldn't have done that. And they knew you Googled it because that's the only way you would get that picture. You should have got to this picture. But uh, this is actually an acceptable picture for sulfate, which is why you can find it online. But sometimes just finding things online is not the right choice because it doesn't apply to the class you're doing. So uh, it is okay. Sulfur in this case has 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 uh electrons which is perfectly okay for it they're actually both okay pictures right uh again if you follow the steps you would end up with this picture or if you followed 
again online, maybe you would have ended up with this picture in this case. So why is this picture oftentimes found online for sulfate versus the other picture? It goes back to formal charge yeah, that we talked about earlier. If we calculate the formal charge on the sulfate on the left there that is single bonded, and we do it for the oxygen there in that case, that's going to be 6 minus 2, 4, 6 minus 1 half of 2 for each of the single bonded oxygen. That's going to give us a negative 1, which means negative 1, negative 1, negative 1, and negative 1 would be the formal charge on each of those oxygens. If we look at the sulfur there in the single bonded situation, uh, the formal charge would be 6 minus 0 minus 1 half of 8. And that's basically going to be 6 minus 4. It's going to give us a plus 2. The sulfur here has a plus 2 charge. Overall, plus 2 and minus 4 is minus 2, right? Gives us the overall charge that you want. Now, if we do uh, the formal charge for this guy, the oxygens will end up the same, minus 1 and minus 1. We now have a double bonded oxygen there, and that's going to be 6 minus 4 minus 1 half of 4. That's going to be a zero formal charge for that guy and that guy. And if we go to our double bonded sulfur in that second picture, that's going to be 6 minus 0 minus 1 half of 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 gives us zero between the two and based on formal charge, which one's actually the better picture in this case? It is actually the Google picture based on formal charge is better in this case because with the double bonded oxygens there and the sulfur can handle that, it obviously minimizes the formal charge definitely on sulfur to zero versus plus two and also minimizes the formal charge on two of the oxygens from minus one to zero, right? So obviously more zero and stuff like that. So again, this is a situation where, you know, you might come up with two different structures uh, based on formal charge. Actually, the guy on the right would be better. Um, but again, if you were not asked to draw your Lewis structure, uh, the best structure based on formal charge, either one of the two pictures is perfectly fine to draw. Any questions on that there? Okay. So again, cautionary note, don't just Google things. It might not be the right thing to use. That's... All right. So why don't you try some of these here? Uh, why don't you draw these three uh, guys? This is uh, BRF5, CLF3, and we'll do XEF4. So draw so let's take a look since we're going to end here. Uh, we'll do the same thing. Uh, so bromine is group 7. So is fluorine. There's five of them. And that's 35 and 5 is 42, I think, there, electrons. So in case of uh, bromine and fluorine, bromine is the least electronegative, so it's going to go in the center. We got five of these guys. So however you want to arrange it, like normal, just with the fifth one, wherever. Still going to do a single bond from the center to each of the outside atoms. So that is two, four, six, eight, ten electrons. Going to fill up the outside ones first. So 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, uh, 30, 32, 34, 36, uh, 38, and 40 in this case. So I have now filled up all the outside ones with eight. I actually still have two electrons to go. Those two, just like normal, will end up on the center atom as a pair of dots. In this case here, all the fluorines have uh, eight. The bromine has two, four, six, eight, 10, uh, 12 electrons, which is okay as it's below sulfur on the periodic table and has the ability to do that. Any questions on that there? Here, uh, we got seven plus uh, three times seven, so 21, 28 valence electrons. Once again, here between chlorine and fluorine, chlorine is going to be the least electronegative, so it should be in the center. We'll have three fluorines. Single bonding up, going to give us six electrons, so that's 22 to go. So two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. 
14, 16, 18. In this case, we have now placed 24 total electrons. We still have four more to go. Also goes on the center atom as pairs of dots. So we should end up like that. Again, the fluorines have eight. The chlorine here has gone above to 10 electrons. Also, okay, because it is next to sulfur on the periodic table, has those d orbitals available to do so. Any questions on those two? Lastly, that's our friend Xenon, which is group eight, actually. Uh, and we have four group sevens. Uh, seven times four is 28, plus eight is like 36, maybe. Uh, we're going to put Xenon in the middle because Xenon is a noble gas. It is chemically inert and also has an electronegativity value basically at zero. So it is the least electronegative. Uh, fluorine will go on the outsides. We can go one, two, three, and four. So that's eight electrons. Uh, Going to leave us something like 28 to go. So two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, and 24 electrons. Again, at this point, we got about 32 placed on there. Uh, remaining four are going to go on the central atom in pairs as well. And now we should have, I think, 36 electrons, and everybody should be good. Any questions on any of those octet rules? Expand these are obviously all expanded octets, and you can still follow, obviously, the same procedures we did for regular 